Generative AI is one of the hottest hobbies right now. But what does it look like you're able to become the head of AI for a global company and working on generative AI and also lead an amazing team to achieve greater purposes? And what does this look like you're able to move from Brazil to UK with visa sponsorship and really create an international career? There's a lot of new opportunities that Nicholas created for himself, for his family. And in this video, our guest speaker, the head of AI, Nicholas, is going to share with us how he created international career as the head of AI at it Save the Children International. Hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee, a director of product and featured in Forbes. I've helped 100 people land the dream PM job offer in fan companies, a unicorn startup, and continue to get promoted as a product leader. In this channel, we cover tech trends and free product management training. Like and subscribe and check out our new video every Tuesday. And today we have the head of AI, Nicholas, at Save the Children International in UK to share with us how he created international career in this very hot tech topic right now. So now let's welcome Nicholas. How are you, Nicholas? Thank you for joining the show with us. Hello. So thank you for inviting me, Nancy. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. So such an and... honor to have you on our show. So Nicholas, can you quickly introduce yourself to the audience? Oh, hi, uh, I'm Nicholas and uh, I'm a 10 years of experience product manager in the AI field and digital health. Uh, right now I'm working at the Save the Children International as head of Generative AI, an NGO that impacts more than 50 million children around the world in more than 100 countries. So this is my dream job right now. So I, I'm very happy to be able to deliver the state of the art technology for good without having to spend so much brain power on how are we going to make money out of this. Awesome. So Nicholas, um, actually, I was very inspired by many different things in your career. First of all, it's your immigration journey. And second is to actually become the head of AI. So let's talk about your entire journey. Based on my understanding of your background, actually, you only were educated in Brazil. You're Brazilian. You never work outside Brazil. And right now, your company sponsors you to move to UK. Can you tell us how did you actually become the head of AI in a UK based company as a Brazilian immigrant? So I was struggling a lot with the with how to organize LinkedIn resume, everything like that. So I was two months looking for opportunities and uh, struggling a lot to get interviews. Then I found out about the PMA and then uh, I was able to organize everything, understood what I was doing wrong. And the key thing was to understand that being a great professional is completely different from being a great candidate. So I needed to understand how to play this game of a candidate, of how to brand myself better, how to communicate better. So all of this I learned. And after getting set uh, the core things, I, I was able to get a lot of uh, uh, invites for interviews, dozens a month. And I was able to choose very carefully where I would want to be. So that's when a recruiter from the Save the Children International approached me. And it was very interesting because I was in a lot of interviews before for uh, US. And uh, one of the problems I was having is that uh, the recruiter asked if I was in US already. But I, I was in Brazil working for a company based in the US. And uh, another interesting information is that a lot of whole roles had the information that uh, we need someone who sees diversity as something, as a power, as strength, as something important, okay. But I found out that uh, most of them don't just write this on paper. So Save the Children International, uh, I'm, I'm working one month already and I see they apply this in practice. So I'm very happy to have found a company that truly sees diversity as a power. So talking with the recruiter, it was very interesting mm -hmm. because I decided to be myself and be more humane with her and show my passion for doing technology for good. And then she understood that I was, they were not looking for a candidate from somewhere outside US. So they were looking for the best AI PM candidate from US and they w were able to find me. And then in the interviews, the recruiter understood that if I were the best candidate for the role, it doesn't matter where I work. So everything worked out and the institution 
struggled a lot with bureaucracies to get me to the UK so that they can hire me. And I really, really, truly appreciate that. So it was not an easy journey, bureaucratically wise, but uh, we were together on that. So I felt uh, really embraced. Awesome. So right now you already start a new job and they sponsor visa. I also, I also heard that they're going to sponsor your whole family to move there as well, right? To UK. Yes. Yes. Not the whole thing because the cats uh, <laughs> need additional <laughs> things. But uh, the visa process, the, the travel to get the biometrics, uh, everything. So I'm really glad. This is awesome. Such inspiration. Also the first month of expenses. So I, I truly appreciate that. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Poor cat. She needs to learn British accent before she can move over. Uh, but I'm so glad the company actually discovered that you are the best candidate, regardless where you're based. And then they just need to create the visa uh, sponsorship and the right opportunities for you to move over to UK. This is such an inspiring story for everybody. Now, Nicholas, let's also dive deeper. You said at the beginning, your challenge was you apply for jobs online. Nobody gave you opportunity because you're based in Brazil or maybe your resume wasn't well written, maybe it has nothing to do with Brazil, right? So tell us what kind of challenges have you faced when you land your next job as head of AI in an international company? And how did you conquer those challenges? At the very beginning, uh, I was trying to go get into the interviews and then try to have the conversation. And uh, after that, when asked it, I had the H-1B visa or everything, then uh, yeah, say the truth, of course, I don't have it. I work remotely and will prefer working remotely. And I spent a lot of time with that, uh, with these interviews. What uh, I changed on my behavior was I started thinking that uh, uh, maybe one, one curious one curious case was uh, an, in, an recruiter that approached me mm -hmm. and then uh, called me on the phone to interview. And uh, instead of interviewing me, he spent the first 50 minutes of the, the one hour we had together just selling the company, saying, this company is so good for you, your role, your, your experiences are great, you're the best person, we need you to start right now. So he spent 50 minutes just selling the company and, and I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. In the last uh, minute, he asked, okay, so just to be sure, are you right now in US? Are you a US citizen? Then I said, no, I am not a US citizen. I'm a Brazilian citizen. I work for a company that's based in the US remotely. And then he he went from 100 excitement to zero, like, ah, uh, uh, okay. So I call you back in three weeks. <laughs> then at that, that uh, changed uh, some, some buttons here on my brain. I started thinking, well, mm -hmm. maybe I just losing time with this. So I need to get into a company or a place uh, or talk with people that truly appreciate the intercultural improvements that uh, hiring someone from outside the US can bring to the company. Yeah. And then uh, I stopped going into all interviews and then I started saying right away, I'm Brazilian, I don't have the H1B and I don't have citizenship. And, and then I, I started after setting everything up, as I learned in the PMA course, I was receiving a communication from recruiters two to three times a week. So they sent sending roles directly to me. Then I started just saying, no, I'm not a US citizen. If this isn't a problem for you, uh, let me know. We can schedule a meeting. So here's my resume. Okay. And then I filtered out 90% of uh, propositions, saved a lot of time and went into real opportunities. I found out I had some offers from companies that were interesting in the health tech sector, but not exactly what I wanted. So I just waited a little bit more. And when the recruiter from Save the Children approached me, and then I learned about the organization. I, I fell in love with Instant. I fell in love with this story and this organization. It's a 104 years old organization with 17,000 uh, people. And before I was in a startup, very fast, very agile, with uh, hundreds and a few people. <laughs> so it's a big change for me. Yeah. And uh, I'm learning that they really see with good eyes the PM experience. This is awesome. So basically you conquer the first challenge in terms of visa, people do not embrace your international experience. Can you also tell us more regarding how you land ahead of AI bro? Because the two challenges, there's lots of even Americans, they don't need visa sponsorship. Most of them couldn't land ahead of AI role. So how do you actually climb up to become the head of AI, especially you're just senior PM, right? So now you become head of AI in a such large international organization, move you to UK, you must be much better than other candidates. Can you tell us more regarding how you made it happen? 
and how to really like make you stand out compared with other candidates. Okay, so I always focus a lot in on impact. I think uh, there is a big hype around AI always had, and uh, people think that uh, displaying ability with with uh, algorithms and techniques will make them a good AI PM. But that's not the case. To be a good or a great AI PM, you need to be always focused on the problem you are trying to solve and the impact you are going to generate with that. All the time, question yourself, am I solving a problem or am I looking for a problem to use my tool? So AI should be the last tool you, you decide to use because of the complexity with data versioning, with software versioning, with how the user is going to interact with it, the UI, UX around AI is very hard. So you should always try to not use AI, use simpler solutions. Of course, I fell a lot before in my career, I fell a lot in the trap of trying to overcomplicate things until I learned out that uh, the most important things to generate impact, to drive impact, to move pointers, KPIs, and I was able to focus on that and in the interviews, when asked about uh, technicalities, I always started uh, reaffirming, reassuring that the most important thing is the pointers we're trying to move, the impact we want to generate. In the case AI is, is necessary, then I would work like that. And I think mm -hmm. they, it was important for a big uh, organization like that not to have someone that is blind, blind by the excessive brightness of technology. I think this is the key phrase, don't let yourself blind get blinded by the excessive brightness of technology. Awesome, awesome. You actually shared this with our alumni panel for our private communities inside PMA. Regarding now the head of AI, you're selecting the best AI product manager to join the company. You set up a trick question, right? Can you set up, can you tell us the trick questions you set up and show them uh, as, a, as an example, what do you mean by, hey, AI is the last solution, and but lots of people just want to dive into AI, show them, I know this AI and everybody has AI. Everyone's every startup company, they say, oh, we're AI startup, they can raise more funding. You know, everyone just want to add AI to it, but sometimes it's not necessary. So show us the example, show us within the private conversation and, and take the best AI candidate. Yeah, okay. So uh, at that time, I was a lot of the time in the side of the person who hires uh, someone. And uh, even for data scientists, at, at that time I was hiring a data scientist. I don't go all the way only, I don't look only to their ability with algorithms, algorithms and their understanding on that. Uh, so I had a trick to see if the person is actually thinking or is just uh, repeating things. Uh, so one tricky question I came up is, uh, actually it's a three-part question. First, I ask, uh, if you had an exam and you had to use to detect, uh, for instance, a nodule in this image, what technique would you use? Then the person answers, convolutional neural networks, okay, cool, so this is the best results, great. If you need, then I, I went to the second question, what uh, if you need to detect uh, horns in a sound, what technique would you use? Then the person answers, uh, recurrent neural networks, great, okay, that works. And then I came with the final killing question, which 90% uh, of people failed directly. Okay, so now which technique or solution would you use to control the traffic lights in a crossing? Then the person answers, ah, columnar AI. No, man, no, reprove it instantly because it's a statistical, it's this and it's statistical too. It, it will fail no matter what, 1% of the time, 5% of the time, and people will die. <laughs> so you'll never, you'll never use AI for a critical application like that. And it, it was very important because I was working in the health tech sector. So you, you don't have room for mistakes. You need to know when can you be fast, when can you use AI, and when you do you need to, to go slow to be very, very careful with what you're doing. That's the trick, yeah. <laughs> Very smart question. So basically, like all other questions about true AI questions. The last question, you shouldn't use AI for traffic lights control at all, or even flight control. I have some students come out, oh, why don't we use AI to control the fly pattern, like Delta flight, United flight, use AI to control the flight of the airplane. Say, oh, then we're gonna have airplane crashes soon. Sooner or later, well, whatever small percentage chance will happen because AI sometimes, as you said, is, is a mathematical algorithm. Sometimes it makes mistakes, but when it makes a mistake for mission critical things such as flight or healthcare or even traffic lights, 
it cannot happen at all. It's not tolerable. So people just want to stuff in AI as a keyword to show them they know something, but they were just tricked by your smart question. That's very smart. <laughs> like ninety percent people fell on the spot. <laughs> Use AI to control traffic. Yeah. Like cool. I learned something new. Everybody, if you like this new <laughs> interview trick questions, and comment down below and like this video. Let us know what do you think. All right. So next, I have a lot of them. <laughs> you have lots. Comment below, hey guys, if you want to hear more, we will more, more, make more video about trick, <laughs> mass fail, AI interview questions, and 95% of them failed. What about you? Awesome. Okay, cool. So now I'd like to talk more regarding what specific most important shift that push you to the next level. For example, as you jump from just senior PM to head of AI in a large international company, what do you think is the most important shift? that push you to the next level? I think uh, the most important shift was to, there were there were two that I can see looking looking retroactively right now. The first one is that I started to understood my career as a product. I, I always said I, I'm not a good salesperson. I'm not a good negotiator. I am a good product manager. So this, uh, how to manage a product, I know how to do, to look at the KPIs, to, to troubleshoot what's happening, why, uh, interview, get feedback. When I just something clicking in my mind, I think maybe one tip or trick that someone gave me in the community, then I started to <laughs> to understand, ah, okay, so if my career is a product or uh, this journey of getting a better opportunity is a product, I need to understand my funnel, uh, where am I failing in, or where am I losing the opportunity in the funnel? What's the conversion rates uh, expected from sending resumes to to getting interviews to getting a second interview to getting to the hiring manager and then getting offers and i selected kpis i and using linkedin to understand how many people were visiting my profile how, how many recruiters a week so i used these techniques and was able to get to the bottlenecks and then went from two two months without any interview to two three interviews a week. So it it were small things. I it's not worth that I say it here because for every person it's going to be different. But what is important is to understand what are where are these real real knots these little knots uh, that are preventing you. Exactly. Another knot that was preventing me for success is a cultural trait that we Brazilians have. So What's it's that? for us, it's very arrogant to say, I have done this, I have done that. So even for our interviews uh, in Brazil with Brazilians, if the person just starts talking, I did that, I did X, Y, and Z, we think, well, what about the others, the team? How? So we directly understand that this person is not a good team player. Yeah. And for us Brazilian, collaboration is extremely important. Mm -hmm. So, but for US, I learned that it's not, it's different. So I needed to say, I did that because I did that. And it's not, there's no shame on that. So that helped me a lot, I think, because in, in you, for a US company or others, if you just say, we did that, they think different. They think that uh, probably you are only one more person in a big team and probably didn't do nothing for real. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I like you highlight the... those culture differences. Um, actually, in the US, you're right, it's opposite. When you go into an interview, you say, we did this. They didn't know what exactly you did. They just felt like you might be the one who hiding behind, take other people's credit. And US culture is also very big on entrepreneurship and leadership. A leader always, I led a team to do this. Yes, yeah, a team of 20 people, but I led them to do this, All right? It's more about help you to stand out from the competition, but you're right, I'm, I'm Chinese culture as well. We, we try to be humble. And it doesn't work in other uh, culture, but only work in US cultures. It's very, very special. I'm glad you brought this up so people are more aware of the differences between different cultures and, and also know how to navigate when you jump from countries to countries. So Nicholas, you have started your head of AI position um, in your new job. So can you tell us, give us high level overview, what does the AI PM do in your day to day? Uh, so what an AI PM does is exactly what a PM does, plus understand or be prepared for the additional challenges that can come uh, with AI. These additional challenges are, for instance, uh, now you have to deal with the data. So the data life cycle, you need to deal with uh, engineers overcomplicating things. I I can say because I'm an engineer and I overcomplicated things in the past. <laughs> so engineers will always want to, to use the latest technology. But as an AI PM, you need to know enough to ask the questions 
that simplify the products that uh, target people to what uh, is the impact that you are trying to drive. And the IPM must also understand the how do you make sure that your developments in AI uh, are going to reach production and generate the impact you want. Mm -hmm. It's hard because you don't know exactly sometimes the level of data literacy, the yeah. knowledge the final user is going to have regarding AI. So these are questions you need to ask yourself. Uh, what's the level of explainability will, that will be needed? For instance, just a, a label saying you have a disease or not, it will suffice. If you are building an AI system for a specialist radiologist doctor, probably yes. But uh, for a, a technician, uh, you need to provide uh, heat maps and uh, point exactly what's happening. But then comes the crucial question after that. Okay, so your user understand what the AI is saying. Is he in a position to do any kind of action that generates value for him or for his company or for your company? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not. So this AI prediction, the solution should maybe should not exist. So I think mm -hmm. this is the hardest part to understand. You start with the problem, but after that you need to ask what uh, action do I need from the user to be triggered with the help of AI achieve a solution for this problem. I see. So sounds like it's less about, hey, let's hire some smart PhDs from MIT to build the AI model. And it's not about, hey, let's hire some smart like engineer from Stanford to train the AI models collecting data. It's more you understand you collect data to make sure the data is clean. But the harder question is once you bring it over to the end users, how do they use it? And, and also is this the right interaction interface for them to use it? And also how exactly they can make decisions using AI, am I right? Yes, and uh, you need to take it to, to have in mind that there are three levels of AI implementation. Mm -hmm. The first one is when you use AI to improve an existing feature or empower that. The second level, which is deeper, is when you build a new feature that wouldn't be possible without AI. Mm. And the third level is when you build an entire product that wouldn't be possible with AI. So AI PMs are most needed here in the third. If you are in the first level, just improving an already existing feature that already generates value, probably you just need a data scientist or maybe a developer using an off-the-shelf solution. Mm. But the AI PMs really shine when you use AI to produce something that's completely new. An example of that are, uh, for instance, self-driving cars. True. Uh, something like that, yeah. Exactly. Actually, we talked several self-driving car live cases in the PM Accelerator talking about how AI is being heavily used in self-driving car. And actually, I happened to build the very similar technology called machine vision in my first PM job as an AI product manager. And also the same technology also used for self-driving cars because the, the original one was more for smart cities to reduce car crashes. But the same thing being used by self-driving car. You, you're absolutely right. This is a foundation for self-driving car even exists running on top of AI, but some applications Application, if the marginal improvement, you may not need the AI product manager, maybe just existing product manager hire some data engineers, add something new to it, such as something called Notion AI. I found it very funny. Notion is just yeah. no taking tool there. It's a very, very good organization tool. They just call themselves oh. Notion AI and then have some kind of AI in it. They become an AI company, of course, good for them. So it helps them to go IPO, increase the stock price, but it's not the kind of what you describe, the very necessary true value of AI product manager to create any company. Thank, thank you for hearing the insight with us. This is awesome. Yeah, there is one other insight that I'd like to share. I think I could also summarize the whole of an AI PM as someone that can uh, understand the data strategy, match this with the with the product strategy and generate a moat, a business moat, so MOAT. So a sustained advantage for the company over time and leverages the power of the data to the core of this mode. So you need to build cycles like this. The, the more data you, you have, the better is your product. The better is your product, more users you have, more data you have, more or better data as well. So if you can build the cycle in which the quality of your product will always improve with the amount of data you have, so this, this data will be private, it will be generated within, it's, it's mandatory that this generate this data, or part of it is generated within the company product. So the company will have something that others don't have. So technology by itself is never a moat, is never a sustained advantage, but uh, this technology together with the data aligned with the product strategy, then you have something that truly shines. It's an advantage like the network effect. So yeah. you have the network effect, 
contact with uh, providers and users, uh, you put data on that and then uh, it's the same thing looking through uh, software and other links. Awesome. I like how you teach other people using very simple concepts to understand the, the cycles and continue to grow in the bigger loop of stronger AI ecosystem. This is amazing. Um, Nicholas, let me ask you, Nicholas, now as um, head of uh, generative AI, what kind of advice do you have for people who want to break into product management or who want to become an AI PM? First of all, uh, what I learned, and you will probably learn, learn as well, should learn, is that if you are someone that is a generalist and uh, wants to build things and make sure that these things achieve people uh, that get in production, generate value for the person, for your company. If you're someone that has this mindset, chances are that you are probably already a product manager. You just don't know that yet. I was really lost in my career from many years because I wanted to do everything, but uh, there was no specific role uh, for this do everything person that is the glue between teams and outside teams. And then I learned about the PM role. And then I thought, ah, okay, that's it. So there is a role of that. I can follow people, I can get courses on that. The first thing is to acknowledge uh, if you have uh, these, these aspirations, and if you like to work like that, then get some formal training first. I started with uh, Professor Alex Cole from Virginia Darden Business School, which uh, helped me to to organize my thoughts a lot and uh, learn a lot of new tools. And then uh, a, a few years later, uh, through the with your help, Dr. Nestle, I was able to understand how to wrap this uh, all of this and leverage this for getting better uh, good opportunities in the market. First of all, understand that uh, if this is your core, your PM, then get some formal training. And uh, okay, now becoming an AI PM, which is more specific. Uh, I would spend some time or invest some time understand learning about the off-the-shelf tools first. What are the, the tools, the things you can use off the shelf? Uh, for instance, detecting things on images, detecting sounds in OCR, a lot of these things, you have a lot of solutions within Google, Azure, AWS. You won't uh, need to spend too much to use that. Do some proof of concepts, maybe, if you know how to code. And uh, it's important, I think, to, to look at things that uh, data science won't be looking. How does the pricing strategy or rules work for the solutions. I found out a lot of solutions that uh, look very cheap at the beginning and then when you put in production the, the cost scale very fast. Uh, the same things happening with generative AI already. I saw some companies with some pricing strategies. For instance, they charge very cheap for input tokens but uh, they are very expensive for output tokens. And they are a company that deliver proposals, for instance. So they generate a lot of text, so it gets expensive very, very fast. So understand pricing. One experience I had was that uh, at some point our company was stuck because the AI models were too expensive. We used it, mm. the best tools available that uh, yeah. the big techs that was accelerating us suggested and the great work it. But then we were not able to launch more models because it was too expensive. We were, we were with 1 million exams a year with a cost of uh, $200 per model per month. Then we migrated to another tool that doesn't make the AI model online all the time, just uh, scales up and scales down. And then we were able to reduce this from $200 uh, to less than $2. So <laughs> because our peak of usage was very, very narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if you start to develop these skills, understand the pricing, the off-the-shelf off solutions, organize that on our mind, ask the question, I think as a PM, you, you are already transitioning to an AI PM role. This is this the is very awesome. beginning. And then you get deeper with your engineers, you learn from them and then uh, become even uh, better. Ah, another important thing is to start to get to uh, understand what I don't think this is this is trainable or you can study it. You, you, you get with experience the know-how, the, the feeling, when to pursue it and mm -hmm. uh, in-house a solution, when to hire a solution from a provider, a small startup provider, and when to wait for a big tech to launch the same solution. I see. So basically there's a steps of tiers people need to do, right? You must understand the basic product management, be a great product manager first. 
And then you can make AI specific decision in terms of pricing, existing tools, which ones to use based on the use usability of uh, customers. And then you figure out how would you try to like in-house and outsource, what kind of more high level strategic decisions you need to make as AI PM. Awesome, mm -hmm. this is great, cool. Hey guys, do you know that Nicholas is going to uh, film a second video talk about index regarding product, uh, AI, generative AI for everyone training for everybody. So make sure to like and subscribe this video and also check out our next video right here. That is the generative AI training for everybody. So you can also become an AI product manager. He's gonna dive into all those three steps we just described here. Looking forward to see you in our next video. And Thank you so much, Nicholas, for joining us today. If people want to find you, where can they find you? Okay, so LinkedIn. I don't have any other. Ah, I already I have Medium as well. So sometimes I post these thoughts, these insights I have there. So Medium and LinkedIn, I think is the most. Awesome. Yeah, reach out yeah. to him on Medium and LinkedIn. I'm going to share all the links in the description of this video as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Nicholas. We're going to see you in our next video right here. We're going to in-depth training of generative AI for everybody. This is Darkness Lee from PMXerter.io. See you in my next video right here.